marketing consultant and author of the novel Radio Silence. Stephanie Perlow gave his speech on December 13, 2013, at the Neptune Theater in Seattle, Washington. Walking with RJ by Stephanie Perlow. I was 23 years old when I had my first child. I was in labor for three days when my son RJ was born. So when I first laid eyes on him, I felt nothing but exhaustion and I thought, this is it. It wasn't until about an hour later, he was wrapped up in my arms and I felt it. That rush of maternal love, that primal adoration and I thought, this is it. This is how the species survives. I had another child, a daughter Emma, and soon after Emma was born, their father and I divorced. He moved to Europe and I raised the kids by myself. Fast forward, we're living in Seattle. The kids are both in high school and they're doing great, they get straight A's. And the only time RJ gets in trouble is because he wears his hair long. And he goes to Catholic school and they're supposed to wear their hair above the collar. But RJ plays the drums, he's in theater, so he wears his hair long. In the fall of his junior year, RJ's cast as the lead in his school play. He's going to be Atticus Finch in To Kill a Mockingbird. So he has to get his hair cut. And I remember him walking out of the barber shop, and he had a crew cut, and he was six feet tall and impossibly handsome. And he had this kind of shy smile. And I thought, this is the man he is becoming. In the January of his junior year, that's 2003, a cop shows up at my door. And he said, are you RJ's mom? And I said, yes. And he said, there's been an accident. And I said, is he dead? And he said, not yet. But we have to get to the hospital right away. So the cop drove me to Harbor Room, and we went in the back where the ambulances were, and I see someone hosing blood out of the back of an ambulance, all this blood, and I remember thinking, that's my son's. And we walk in, and I see RJ being milled away on a gurney just for a second, but I recognized his haircut. It took me a few hours to find out what happened. RJ had been driving to his best friends, he had a seatbelt on, he had no drugs or alcohol in his system, and he was hit from the side in a blind intersection. He suffered from a traumatic brain injury, or a TBI, and he broke his pelvis. Now, at the time, I was the vice president of an advertising agency that was owned by a global conglomerate advertising agency, and they had just changed their insurance plan. Now, keep in mind, this is the first week of January, so I don't have a list of my benefits, what's called the summary plan description. All I have is a card with a number on the back. So while RJ's in the ICU, I make the call. And they tell me ICU is covered, intensive brain injury is covered, our most of our nursing facilities are covered, and all these great benefits. And I remember thinking, thank God, I don't have to worry about insurance. I've done everything right. When RJ was discharged from the ICU, he was moved to a rehab center. And soon after he got there, they called me on the phone and they said, your insurance called and RJ's benefits are up on Friday. And I said, no, 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 he has this many more benefits. But of course, all I have is a voice on the other end of the line. I don't have a summary plan description. So I went over there and I said, where am I supposed to take him? He's in a coma. And they said, there's always foster care. So Emma and I took RJ home. We set up a hospital room in his bedroom. He had a pet tube in his stomach and that's how we pumped in nutrition. They taught us to do physical therapy. Emma was only 15. And you know, coming out of a coma is a long, slow, painstaking process. It took RJ weeks just to learn to hold up his head. His friends would come by and we put him in his wheelchair. And the girls took to coming by in short skirts and they walked back and forth in front of his wheelchair and RJ would lift up his head. <laughs> 
months had passed and I still couldn't get the summer plan to church. I'd keep calling and they'd be on the phone and telling me my benefits and I'd say, look, you're looking at a computer screen. Just give me a screenshot of the screen you're looking at. And they wouldn't do it. And that's when I realized this is not some bureaucratic mix-up. This is intentional and this is illegal. And this is a violation of a law called ERISA. So I contact an ERISA lawyer and tell him a situation. And he says, I can help you. But first, I need a retainer of $30,000. And I said, let me be clear. I am a single mother. I have paid to set up a hospital room in my house. I pay a nurse to sit with my son so I can go to my job, so I can keep this insurance. I don't have $30,000. And he said, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Now at this point, I was very frustrated and I was extremely worried about losing my job because I had taken so much time off. So I applied for the FMLA grant. The Family Medical Leave Act says that you can take 12 weeks of unpaid leave to care for a sick family member and they have to keep your job for you. Shortly into my leave, I was fired. Now these things are illegal, but you can't call the police on a corporation, and I couldn't afford an attorney. And when RJ turned 18, he was old enough to go on Medicaid, and I made the decision to put him into a nursing home. I found a facility that specialized in patients with TBIs, and all of their patients were on Medicaid, so they didn't have a lot of money, but they took good care of RJ, and he continued to make slow progress. Uh, one time, Emma and I were visiting, and she was teasing him, and he flipped her off. And I got really excited, because that's the serious manual that Sarah did have to get, right? And then he turned to me and put his hand down, because brain injury notwithstanding, he was not about to flip off his mother. <laughs> in August of 2005, RJ got very sick, and we thought it was the flu. Turns out his PEG tube had fallen out, and that happens, and when that happens, you just have to put it back in and x-ray to make sure it's in the right place. Well, this facility couldn't afford an x-ray machine, so they guessed, and they guessed wrong. RJ's food had been going into his abdominal cavity, and he had sepsis. And at the hospital, the surgeon pulled me aside and she said, I can operate on RJ, and I might save his life, but he will go back into a deep coma, and he will never come out. Or you can let him go. You have to decide. So I go into RJ's room, and he's very aware of what's happening, and he's scared, and I said, honey, you're very sick, and they can't fix you, so you're going to go to God. And I tried to think of people he knew who had died, but he was only 19. So I thought of my dad, who passed away before RJ was born, and I said, honey, you're going to go to God, but my dad's going to be there, and he's going to come and find you. I'll be there soon. It took RJ three days to die. It took him three days to come into the world and three days to leave it. People ask us how we cope. Emma has been an EMT, a volunteer firefighter. She works in an emergency room that is a trauma center and she's applying to nursing school. My friends saw what happened to me, and they started a nonprofit to help people who are struggling with their insurance company for covered benefits, even if they don't have enough money for an attorney. And I'm the chair of the board. We have our ERISA lawyers, and they're very good at what they do. RJ would be 27 years old. I still have that strong maternal love for the challenge now is to channel it so it doesn't become corrosive. 
Between the time of RJ's accident and his death, he was only able to say a handful of words. But the word he said most was mom. And there are times now where I feel RJ. And in those moments, I know that it's his turn for his love to carry me because I'm his mom. 